3 and verse number 8. I'm going to read three verses here. Philippians 3, verse number 8. It says this. It says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered and the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win with Christ. And be found in him, and having mine own righteousness, which is in the law, but which is through the faith of, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Dear heavenly Father. Lord, we just thank you for your word, Lord, and this is a powerful few verses of text that we've read, and Lord, it's a powerful phrase that we want to look at this evening, and Lord, I know I'm not uh, an eloquent speaker, I'm not uh, good enough here by no means, I just need you to use us here this evening and help us, and I, I really believe, Lord, this is what you'd have us to hear, and it's something I, I, I need to hear. It's something that we all need to hear on a daily basis. Uh, just help us here and grow closer to you, Lord. And let's open this heart to where our hearts to where it falls on good ground here this evening. In Jesus' name, Amen. The phrase that I really want to look at is Philippians three, verse number ten, and it, it's it's this phrase here, and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the title of the message: is the fellowship of his sufferings. And uh, I heard this in a message a while, uh, several weeks back, and I'm telling you, it was like an a, a alarm going off or a shaking in my life just hearing this phrase, and I really haven't gotten past it. Uh, I, I feel like the devil's tried to get me to skip over this, this and I nearly... But the thing about it is, uh, I really believe it's what the Lord would have us to, to be on here this evening. Paul's writing the book of Philippians and he's motiv his motivating factor. What was behind Paul and everything that Paul said and done was this. He wanted to know Christ. Not only did he want to know Christ, but he, he wanted to know him as personally. He just wanted to know Christ as, as close as he possibly could. And to the 2020 Christian, to this day that we live, the last thing a lot of times that you want to hear preached and the last thing that we want to think about is in verse number 10, the fellowship of his sufferings. But when we do experience things in life and we do experience life and things happen, the last thing you want to think about is they say it's a fellowship and you're fellowshipping with his suffering. What we want to do a lot of times is bypass it. A lot of times we would just want to put it in uh, overdrive and get through the storm as fast as possible. Here in the text, though, Paul's doing the opposite. Instead of saying, why me, as we would do, Paul's saying, why not me? In other words, Christ suffered, I ju I'm just willing to suffer. And Paul considers his suffering a fellowship with Christ. Because Paul uses that phrase there, it's fellowship of his sufferings. And I want to look at that just a moment. Because I'll tell you, I think it's something completely foreign in our lives. I believe it's something that the everyday Christian, we want to bypass or we want a medication or we want something to help us get through the suffering. But I think there's sometimes that Christ just wants us to go through things. And there's sometimes that Christ just wants us to feel what he felt and go through what he went through so we can better know him, we can better understand him, and we can better lean on him. <clears throat> a lot of times what happens is we pray to get past it. We pray to avoid it. We pray to find that route around it. And I'll tell you, it, it's not always what Christ wants. I want to look at three things. In verse, in verse number 10, it says the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to look at that word fellowship. And what a fellowship is is a partnership. The Greek word for fellowship means partnership, sharing in common or communion. In a partnership, there's a couple things that have to take place. One is there's unity. If you're going to partner with somebody, there's got to be unity, an agreement, a handshake. Uh, you've got to agree on things. And in that agreement, there's unity on their purpose, meaning their fellowship or their partnership, they've got the same purpose, and they're working for the same goal, and there's this uh, unity involved. But also know this, with a partnership, there's like-mindedness. 
says the fellowship of his sufferings, meaning there's unity in that suffering, but there's also like-mindedness. In order to have that fellowship and, and to have a partnership with somebody, you've got to think alike. I would never partner with somebody that I didn't think the same way and have the same vision and the same goals. Their heart must be fixated on the same things. Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't walk in the same direction. You can't go the same path. You can't go together unless you're agreed. My gosh, could you imagine trying to walk together and you're fighting the whole way? But there's a partnership. There's unity. There's like-mindedness. I tell you, a lot of times we, we hear that saying, we hear that phrase, opposites attract. And I agree to some extent. But people cannot be total opposites. One believe in one thing, another believe in another. You cannot be a total, complete opposite. One being a Christian, one not. That's not what it's talking about. But if, if you've heard that phrase, opposites attract, I think sometimes uh, you, you can find you and your partner opposite in a lot of things. But the main thing's got to be the main thing, and you still got to believe Christ. And I'll tell you, in my own life, I, I noticed me and Ashley, we're opposites on a lot of things. First thing in the morning, she's smiling, grinning. Last thing I do is smile in the morning. My coworkers, a lot of times, they say, I don't, they joke and say, they don't talk to me until about 11. I, I, I'm not a morning person by no means. One time our schedule flipped at school. The morning kids had me in the evening. The evening kids had me in the morning. Those kids that had me in the mornings usually had me in the evening. They said, man, you're a different teacher in the evening. I said, well, I woke up. But I'm not. I'm not that type of person. And we know that we're all different. And we oftentimes find that with our relationships. But when it comes to God and it comes to this relationship I'm seeing here, there's got to be unity and there's got to be like-mindedness. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 14, it says, But, not, but be ye not unequally yoked together. A yoke is, is put together for work, and you can't have that yoke upon you and, and, and working and pulling in different directions. You've got to be pulling in the same path. So I see this partnership taking place. What's the partnership? Well, it says the fellowship of his sufferings. Well, who are we fellowshipping with? Who are we partnering with? Second thing I see is the, the person. I see the partnership, but then I see the person, and the person is easy. It's Christ. Look at verse number 10. It says that I may know him. Who's the him? Well, it says the power of his resurrection. They ain't the one person that follows that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Who's got the power of resurrection? That's Christ. Paul here in the text, he has this single ambition. He's got a single goal. He's got a single focus. It's to know Christ. What well, starts with a partnership, you becoming saved, you uh, know him personally, but you've got to know the person of Jesus Christ. See, Paul wanted to be have that intimate relationship with Christ. I'll tell you, uh, you young kids, you, you, you may date, and you may feel like you know everybody, but you don't know them until you get married. I mean, you still are learning things about your partner. And I tell you, Paul wants that, that intimate relationship. So above all, Paul, in his own destiny, and what Paul desires in his life is to know Christ. Can you say right now that the one person that you would love to know, the one person that you want to wrap your mind around is Christ? You know, a lot of times it's yourself. A lot of times it's just your spouse. A lot of times it's your family. But I'll tell you, your family, there's no problem with your family. There's no problem with your spouse. There's no problem with yourself. But Christ ought to come first. And in Paul's life, he wanted to know Christ more than any other thing. More than just a head knowledge. Uh, Paul wanted to know it. He wanted to feel it from head to toe. He wanted to know everything about Christ. How do you know that, preacher? Well, the verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to not just know him, but he wanted to know that power that was able to be resurrection. But not only that, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to have some fellowship with his sufferings. Not only that, but being made conformable even to death. Paul says, I want to know everything about him. I want to know it all the way to his death. I want to know all that. I don't want to just taste that, but I want to taste it all the way to my death. That's a serious, serious Bold statement that Paul's saying. 
I mean, us as Christians, I don't know if we would dare to even, uh, if we ever dared to, to know him and, and to get a grip on Christ in this manner, is to say, I want to know him, even taste his death, feel his death. I want to know what he went through. But that's that partnership. He had a partnership with him, and now he's going to know the person of Christ. And we see this a few times here in the text. Look at verse number 7. In verse number 7, I see Paul's willing. He's willing to lose it all. Verse number 7, it says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Paul's saying everything that I've accumulated, all these things that are worldly, I just count them as lost. I just throw them all away. I just get rid of them all, all earthly possessions. They don't mean a thing until it comes to Christ. Christ means more than that to me. Uh, in verse number 8, Paul says, Yea, doubtless I count all things lost for his excellency. Paul's saying that uh, any emptiness, anything that I could just get rid of in my life, I just want to make space for him in my life. My gosh, does that sound like the 2022 Christian? I want to push everything to the side, and I want to make, make, make some, a vacate. And I don't want a vacation. I want to vacate some places in my life, some areas in my life, and fill him in with those places. That's what Paul's saying. What if we had that kind of desire as Christians? Willing to just lose it all, willing to forsake it all, to understand who Christ is just a little deeper. Paul desired to know everything about Christ and everything in Christ's life he wants to apply to his life. And he wants to know it all. Remember, this is a twofold thing that, that Paul's desiring to, to, to know about Christ. Now here's the thing. With Christ, there's two parts here to Christ. One, it's the Christ that had the power to reign and rule. He wanted to know that Christ. And don't we all want to know that Christ? The Christ that we can pray to. The Christ that came and, and, and conquered it all. The Christ that's seated at the right hand. The Christ that we can pray to that's our, that our advocate to the Father. The Christ that that's the chief cornerstone, the Christ that, that, that conquered death, hell, and the grave, that Christ that's uh, in a, seated at the right hand, that's the Christ that we all want to uh, relate to this, this evening. Man, I want that kind of Christ in my life. I want that. And you want that. We all want that. But it's twofold. See, there's a Christ that ruled, but there's a Christ who suffered as well. And it's a twofold thing here. There's a partnership that he wants, but he wants to also have the person of Christ. But I think a lot of times we like to pick and say, I want that Christ seated at the right hand, but I don't want that Christ that got low. I don't want that loneliness of Christ. We all want Christ in our life. We all want to be Christians. We all want to be more Christ-like. But I'll tell you, that's scary to say that I want the Christ that subjected himself to Christ. We all want that Christ that rules. And I was reading that in the text, I was reminded of in Matthew 20 and verse number 20. We see here, we all want to know that aspect of Christ that rules, and we all want that. There's a, a request here of James and John, his, his, their mother, and in, in, in Matthew 20 and 20, it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant these my two sons, that they may sit, one on thy right hand and one on the left, in thy kingdom. That's what we want. We want one of us on the right, we want one of us on the left, and we want that place of rulership. We want that place of, of power. We want to see God's power and God's movement and God's authority and God's blessings. And we want all these things. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's two sides to the coin. There's the rulership side, but there's the suffering side. And when that hits, we're like, oh, God, I can't take it. And we ain't even felt a drop in the bucket of what he's felt. We got to realize that, that there is this person of Christ that ruled, but there's also that person of Christ that suffered. In that same text in Matthew 20 and 20, I read 20 and 21 right there, but in verse number 22 it says, But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I baptized with? 
they say it to him, we are able. He said to him, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I baptized with. But to sit on my right and on my left is not of mine to give, but it shall be given to them who are prepared of my Father. And he, in other words, what he's saying is, if you want to place some rulership, and we all just want the reward, we all want the goodies, we want the blessings, but he says, you want that? You want that place of power? You want to be at the left or you want to be at the right? There's a, there's a stipulation to that. You've got to drink of my cup. What in the world's the cup he's talking about? It's not a drink. It's the cup of suffering. It's the cup of his wrath. It's him coming and, and, and lowering himself, subjecting himself, him being beaten, him being bruised, him carrying his own carrying that cross, him hanging on that cross, him being ridiculed, him carrying upon the sins of the world, him, him dying. He, that is the, the Christ that we're speaking of. And he says, hey, if you want that cup, if you want to drink of that cup, there's a stipulation. You may ask for that. You may want at that place, but you don't realize what you're asking. But I believe Paul in our text, he, he knew what he was asking. We want the Christ on the throne, not the Christ that suffered. But Paul says, I'll take it both. And I don't care what I have to go through. I'll go through it. But I'll tell you, me and you in our 2022 Christians, that's almost like this. If we paint a picture as we have to go through something or, and we're a Christian, we almost in the back of our mind say, who's going to want to go to church now? Who's going to want to be a Christian that's not what it's about. It's about going through it, but knowing he's there with us. Amen? It's about going through it, but knowing that we have the peace, the power, and, the, and his presence with us. Yes, there's the, the, the place of rulership, but there's also that person, that, that, that Christ that came to this earth and he suffered. Paul even wrote in Galatians 5.20, I'm crucified with Christ. The same way Christ was crucified, I'm crucified with him. Never, nevertheless, I live, yea, not I, but Christ that liveth in me. In other words, I, I've died to myself. I, I, I'm crucified. But now that I'm dead, he's alive and he's living through me. And that's the person we're speaking of. Paul's desire here is to have a partnership, but he's also wanting to know the person of Christ. I want to know that person of Christ is what Paul's saying here in the text. I want to know that person. Well, it's not just the person that rules, it's the person that suffers. But guess what Paul says? I don't care. I just want to know. Because in verse number 10 of our text, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. How are you going to get to the resurrection without leaving everything that takes up to the resurrection? Then he says, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. The early apostles thought this of suffering. They believed that participating in the fellowship of Christ's suffering was part of a preparation for sharing his future glory. In other words, they thought what they went through on this earth, and they thought suffering for Christ's sake was getting them ready for the other side. Wouldn't that be something if we thought that same way sometime? That when we go through it, instead of praying out, we pray through it. In other words, instead of uh, uh, wanting a lifeline or a medication to just get us out of it, we're just saying, hey, Lord, now let me be a blessing to somebody all the way through it. If this is a road that you want me to take and a path that you put me on, so be it, Lord. I'm just going to go through it because I want to suffer. I want the fellowship of your sufferings. And Paul believed that. He believed it so much that he even told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul, I mean, that, that's hard to sugarcoat that. Everybody is godly is going to have it bad. That's what he said. That's bad. That's hard. I don't, I, I, that's hard to hear. And I think Brother Marvin this morning hit the nail on the head. The lost don't feel what we feel. The lost don't go through what we go through sometimes. They're done lost. The devil's done God. But even Peter agreed. In 1 Peter 4, 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. In other words, when you go through these trials, when you face the furnace, don't, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's, don't be alarmed. He says, but rejoice in so much you're partakers of Christ's suffering. In other words, rejoice in the suffering, because you're going through what Christ went through. 
that when the glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad and also exceeding joy. I'll tell you this, as we go through this walk of life and as we, as we go through things, you might as well expect it. Expect trials. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You live godly, you'll suffer. Live godly, they will be easy. What's the alternative? Go to hell. I ain't going to do that. I'd rather suffer, suffer a few things, knowing on the other side is something better, wouldn't you? It's all right. I'd go through it for a season. I'd go through it. The problem is, I don't even, we, neither one of us ain't a soul in here that has to go through it alone anyway. You know, everywhere we go, Christ is going with us. And yes, we might go through it. Yes, we might suffer. But Christ will go with us. I think sometimes we think that we're uh, we're immune to this or we're too good for this or Christ saved us out of this. But we have to go through that. So much so that Christ said something even similar about being a Christian. He says, he said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. How, how comfortable is it carrying a cross? How comfortable is it to, to follow after him and walk in those same footsteps of denying himself as he did? That's not, a, that's not an easy place to be. But our job is just to take up that cross. Our job is to follow him, and that's not an easy thing to do. It's almost like saying, hey, if you want to follow me, it's going, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. But I wouldn't trade it for anything under the sun. Because God's got it all under control. It means you and I ought to be willing to surrender all the way unto death. The same way Christ surrendered all the way to death, we ought to surrender all the way to death. Because in our text, he says this, And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. How are you going to take up the cross? No, we're going to take it and die to ourselves, And we're going to taste the same death that he tasted. What kind of what kind of suffering is that? My gosh. I mean, are we ever going to suffer the same way Christ suffered? I don't know that we ever will. But I do know this, that on the cross, in Matthew 27, 46, Christ said this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he say that? Because all the sins of mankind is converged upon he who knew, knew no sin. He didn't know no sin, and every sin converged on him at one time. The vilest of the vile to the smallest of the small. Everything converged on him, and here he is. Even his own father had forsaken him. You may say, well, what are you saying, preacher? How are we ever? How are we ever going to face that? Well, I find it interesting. And I didn't know it till the other day, but I find it interesting in Psalm 22, in verse number 1. David says the same words. The exact same phrase is mentioned in the book of Psalms, Psalm 22, 1. David, it says a psalm of David, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest me not. And in the night season I am not silent, but thou art holy in thine inhabitants' praise of Israel. What David's saying there, he's saying that I, I know, I know you. Just if we're saying the 2022 20, Christian, he's saying, hey, I know this. I know I know you. I know you live in my heart. I know that I've been born again. But there's times that I cry out, and I don't think that you can hear. I cry in the day. I cry all night long, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, it feels like that you, you, you're, you're nowhere to be found. But I'll say this. If Christ went through it, David went through it. Who are you and I to feel like sometimes that the Father's not turned his back on us? We, we all are going to go through things sometimes. But I do know this. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside, and he's there to be our comforter. He's there to be our shield. He's there to help us. But you and I will suffer. That, but well, here's the thing about it. We have a partnership with Christ. And if we do partner, we do partner with him, we're going to feel everything that he felt. In other words, there's going to be times where I've got my peace. 
I've got the joy, I've got the comfort. It feels like you're walking on clouds. And sometimes that song comes on in the car and the tears well up in your eyes. It feels like the Spirit's just moving. Isn't, you, isn't that good when you feel that? That's God's presence and Him living and working in your life. But there's going to be times where God's going to pull back the reins a little bit. And you'll say, where are you at, Goat Lot? Where are you at? See, this is not heaven. This is not heaven on earth. This is not a place that it's all going to be perfect. But what he wants is he desires us to long for him. Even though we may suffer and even though we may go through things, it's amazing the way God's got it wired together. He gives us enough of him to want more, but he pulls himself away from us just enough to where we're still longing for him and still desiring him. Isn't that true? Isn't that what sin, though, does as well? And it's flesh. It separates us sometimes. But I'll tell you, once you get a dose of him, and once you, 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 you get that, all it takes is just a little bit to come by again. And there he is again. There's going to be times where you feel like he does pull back a little. There's going to be times where it feels like you're just like David, crying out in the morning, crying out at night, and he's nowhere. But there's going to be these times where you don't know that you can make it another day. There's going to be times where you cry out the same thing. Where are you, Lord? Have you forsaken me? But then there's these times where he just passes by. He lines it all up. He helps us out. And you can only say it's him. There's those times as well. In other words, he's the God that's seated at the right hand ruling. But he's also that God that he went through suffering. Here's the thing. We like to say we're Christians, but we like to say we're the Christians sitting at the right hand. But no, if we're Christ-like. Yes, there's going to be times where it feels like we can tread on serpents, we can do anything, and, and, and it's all a walk in the park. But there's going to be those other days. They may be multiple days. It could be months that we may walk and it feels like he's nowhere. But here's the thing. As we go through that, those uncertain situations, it's not a matter of getting out of it. We like to get out of it. Or we like to take something to get over it. Or to numb us to where we don't feel it. What if, though, when we face that, because he went through some things, but there's fellowship in his sufferings. Now, sufferings is plural, meaning there's multiple sufferings that he went through, but there's multiple sufferings that he's going to go through with us. Just because we're living in this day that feels like everything ought to be, I mean, we're so blessed in the United States of America that we, we just feel like we shouldn't have to face nothing. There's something that can get us over everything. But I think sometimes God gets us to these places and makes us, wants us to go through things. Because Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. I truly want to know him. And the only way to know him, the only way to know the power of his resurrection, the only way to know that Easter Sunday when that stove was empty, is to go through all the things leading up to it. And he's wanting us to go through that as well. Why must we suffer? Because there's fellowship in his suffering. That's when we lean on him. That's when we call on him. That's when we really want him. That's when we really desire him. But smooth walking, a lot of times we distance ourselves and we forget about him. There's fellowship in his suffering. And I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Look at that. Being made conformable unto his death. The whole purpose behind it all is to be conformable to his death. You may say, man, that preacher's crazy. He said, don't take medicine. I didn't say that, don't take medicine. There's some things we have to take, we have to do. But I also think there's some things that we have to go through, and we ought to go through it with a different lens now of it's a fellowship of his suffering. There's a better side to it. I'll be honest with you, I've faced things in my own life. Depression and anxiety. There's things in my own life that I, I, I struggle with. I don't broadcast it or anything. 
But at the same time, when you look at it through this lens, that it's a, it, that it's a, it's something that he desires you to go through and to walk through, and he's going to be there through it. And it ain't nothing compared to going through the cross. It ain't nothing compared to what he went through. What's us going through? Just a little bit. And when we face those days, and when we face uncertainty, and when it feels like he ain't going to make it, it's just a fellowship of his suffering. He's wanting us to go through it so we can feel what he felt. And yes, it might feel like he's, he's pulled his hand away from us, but before long, he's going to put his hand right back on it. We're going to feel it again. There's a brighter day coming. Does that mean you're lost? He pulled his hand up? No. You're still a son. You're still a daughter. But there's dark days. There's hard days. But I'll end with this verse here in 1 John 4 and 4. It says, you're of God. How do you know you're of God? Because I'm going through something and I'm facing something right now. You're of God. But he says this little, he says little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In other words, this world looks dark. This world looks dim. Don't feel like I could make it another day, but there's fellowship in the suffering. How do you know? Because we're his little children. He's in us. And there's something greater in me than in this world. There's something greater in me than the darkness of this generation. There's something greater in me than the problem that I'm facing. And my, my, my. Devil gets us those these places. Just we throw in the towel, we give up, we make irrational decisions in those low valleys. That's not a place to make decisions. That's a place to just hold on for dear life and know that God's going to put his hand on you one more time and he'll help you again. Isn't it amazing how God, he don't pour it all on us at one time. Sometimes we get full of ourselves and filled with our own pride, our own sins. We get filled with these other things. Then he has to empty us where we get low. And then all we can do is look up and say, God, I need you again. I can't do it without you. And all of a sudden, that pride builds up. It's, a, it's just a constant wave and a constant cycle. The thing about it is, we leave here this evening. Think about the fellowship of his suffering. Next time you go through something, next time we face something, just think, my gosh, there's fellowship here. It's me and Christ walking through this. It's me and Christ going through it. He brought me to it, and he's going to get me through it. There's fellowship in this suffering that I'm going through. Heads bowed and your eyes closed. I just wonder here this evening, I don't know anybody's heart. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know this. If you're not going through something now, you'll be going through something eventually. Because all the way up into death, there's cycles and times where we go through things. There's times and there's these seasons, and I wish it could always be just the, the perfect mix between spring and summer when it's all beautiful and warm, just warm, not hot, not death and dying, not cold. I wish it could always be that way, but there's seasons of our life. And I think what the Lord wants us to know is, hey, you fellowship with me with whatever you're going through. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't try to get out of it, but go through it. And the whole time you're going through it, know that I'm helping you, but other people are watching. Other people are wondering, are you just going to quit? Are you going to give up? Are they going to throw in the towel? And sadly enough, that's what a lot of people have done in this day that we live. There's fellowship in the suffering. And we see the fellowship of his sufferings. Your Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I know this message and this word and this text was something that I've chewed on, and it's helped me for just a couple weeks now. And Lord, I don't know that I can expound on it, what I could do, but I appreciate you helping me here this evening, Lord. And I don't know everybody's heart, and I don't know what everybody's going through, but I do know this, that everybody's going to go through something, Lord. If they're right here going through something, Lord, I pray that you just help them. I pray that you give them that realization that it's a fellowship going on. And you're going to see them through. There's fellowship in the suffering. And Lord, if they're getting ready to face something, maybe you're just preparing them for a storm getting ready to hit them. But let them know there's fellowship. We don't have to take the easy button. We don't have to just reroute it and try to get out of it. 
There's sometimes you put us through it so you can look bigger. You can magnify yourself and you can be exalted. You can be lifted up. Sometimes there'll be a weight higher than what we can uh, carry. There's a load bigger than we can carry. It's a weight, a, a wall bigger than we can get around. But Lord, you can bring those walls down. You can help us. You can strengthen us. And Lord, we certainly need to let you be that strength. Not try to work it or out our own way. Not try to get out of it, but just have fellowship through the suffering. Lord, you just be with us and help us. Lord, I thank you for what you did, how you've helped our church. You just continue to help us. Thank you for the provisions you've made and how you helped us with our back to school uh, this morning. Thank you for Brother Hollifield and you helping in his ministry. But Lord, you just help us here as we think about these fellowship of sufferings. And you just help us in the coming days. Let this be something that we can chew on and, and help us uh, as we continue our, on this path uh, that you put us on. In Jesus' name, amen.